like to welcome you to this next session. I'm Elliot Gerson, and I, I think I'm going to just say a few words similar to those you might have heard from Jane Harmon yesterday, if you were at uh, one of our preview uh, performances, one of our preview panels. And it's about Damien Wetzel and what we're trying to do with our arts program at the Aspen Institute. Uh, I think if the late Sidney Harmon uh, were here, this panel would represent exactly what he had in mind when he reinvigorated the programs in the arts at the Aspen Institute. The arts are enormously important for so many reasons, and they're, they're, about, they're about beauty, they're about entertainment, they're about creativity, they're about imagination, they're about self-realization. But what we wanted to do with an arts program at the Institute was talk about the arts contributions and essential uh, 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 nexus with everything else about society. We didn't want to disassociate art as something just for performance, but rather something about who we all are, about our aspirations for the kind of communities we want. And so this panel that Damien will introduce and moderate really addresses uh, the role of the arts in, in, in making a good society uh, uh, a, a truly rich society. Sometimes the arts are, un either because of the way they're funded or because of access, are something not just in perception, but sadly, in fact, for only a certain part of the population, and that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, the arts are for everyone, but also the arts can contribute to so many of our problems, and you'll hear about one of our incredible programs and how the arts can, can make a difference, for example, for the millions of young people in America who are disconnected either from school or from work. So uh, it's, it's, it's a different kind of conversation about the role of the arts, but it's precisely the kind of conversation uh, that we had in mind when the arts program was established, and it's precisely the kind of conversation that made it so easy for us to choose Damien Wetzel to run our arts programs at the Aspen Institute. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to you, Damien. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you. Um, so, with that bar set as high as, <laughs> as that, uh, let me say that, first of all, as part of this Ideas Festival, this is uh, what I consider to be an essential session. And I, I called Melody and Eric and I said, would you have this conversation uh, about poverty and inequality and how the arts relate and how the arts can be of more service and more contribution, uh, not simply by entertaining but as Elliot said, about how they become part of the fabric of progress, about the access issue that everyone has the right to participate in, everyone has the right to make benef have benefits from the arts, but it, life is not as simple as that. We live in a time, and we'll talk about, of great inequality, perhaps unprecedented inequality, and how that plays into this conversation. Is, uh, it's a unique part of this citizen artist track, looking at the rights of all citizens of the world to benefit from the arts and partake. Uh, I would also say that uh, we just had a, a funny moment where we, we, we spoke for a little while this morning. I said, God, I wish we could just continue that, have that conversation. And Melody said, uh, yeah, well, just if some people sneak in and listen, that's fine. I said, exactly. And it occurred to me immediately that that is an ideal state. That is what I wanted to have as a conversation. It's, very, it's Jerome Robbins' ideal rehearsal, the great choreographer of great ballets like Dance is a Gathering, Afternoon of Fawn, to musicals like West Side Story. What Jerry used to say to us was, Dance like nobody's watching. That's the ideal. He didn't want to see everybody selling it and performing it. He wanted to, that dream was that we are just having this conversation and they happen. So that's what we're going to try and do. And uh, we'll try and bring you in at the end a little bit. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say it's an honor. Both of you have just, uh, you, you rock my world. I'm so impressed by the work you do. And it's essential that we have these conversations so that the art side of the equation can be integrated. Uh, Melody, you and I have done some work yes. uh, uh, in your role as Domestic Policy Council Chair, uh, and I was on the President's Committee for Arts and Humanities. Uh, we developed a program called Turnaround Arts, mm -hmm. uh, and I immediately knew that uh, you understood the essential values, uh, but not from a isn't it gorgeous point of view, but from what the, what the utility was. And, uh, so maybe we start there. In terms of this, this question, arts inequality and truly rich society. What is it that the arts have to offer in your mind when you look at the, the overall uh, graphic of this country? In that metric of, you know, second gilded age type thing like Tim right. Fowles was talking about of this inequality factor, 
What do you think when, when you consider it? Well, I, I think, well, first of all, thank you all for being here and thank you for asking me to participate and to participate with Eric. I think that of the arts in two ways. I think of the arts as a, both a mirror and I think of the arts as a hammer or a spade, as a work tool. Um, as a mirror because it reflects back to us what is happening around the country in different pockets of our community and places that we may never get to see. We all lead incredibly busy lives. You know, you go from home, you go to work or volunteering and, or school um, to picking up your kids to the grocery store, back home, time with your friends and family. And there are parts of the world, parts of our society that we never see. And the arts can provide us a wonderful lens into those communities and what people are feeling, particularly as we talk about poverty and as we talk about inequality. Um, I also think, and I use the phrase a hammer or a spade, because I think of the arts uh, as a work tool that can help us to engage when they are appropriately and necessarily integrated into the work we do. I think too often the arts get pushed off into a corner and we don't integrate them as we think about economic development, as we think about education, as we think about revitalizing our communities. And that's one of the reasons when we did our work together that we, it was so important and the First Lady and the President recognized the importance of the arts as, a, as an East Wing issue. Mm -hmm. But we also, in the Domestic Policy Council, wanted to make sure that it was part of a West Wing issue and to marry the policy and the performance um, and bringing the American people into the White House to engage with, in this case, American artists, and we wanted to, to weave those two things together. So the mirror and the hammer. Interesting. And then, so, and Eric, you've had multiple lives uh, from working in the Clinton White House to real networks to incredible activities on behalf of citizenship in general. And in our conversations, we talked about you know, what that even means, essentially, and, and, and also particularly about the reciprocal quality of citizenship. And how do you feel, in your, in your experience, the arts relate to that uh, in just in general terms, or what, what do you think? Well, uh, first of all, again, thank you and uh, Aspen Institute for having us here. This is really so exciting, a conversation to begin here. And um, I think Melody put it very well in describing the arts uh, as both this mirror and this hammer. Um, the, the idea that you're alluding to, Damien, of the reciprocal nature uh, of art and citizenship, I, I think is, it can be boiled down to a very simple precept, which is that whether you're talking about politics or you're talking about our lives as uh, art makers or art consumers, uh, true self-interest is mutual interest. True self-interest is mutual interest. And this is a story that we've got to start wrapping our minds around and telling ethically, creatively, politically, in all these different ways. And what that, that, that precept really embodies is this idea that the arts are not a nice thing that are put to the side and you know, get a charity box and we pat their head and then say, that's great, we've done the arts and that's a nice thing. The arts are as much an, an engine, a seedbed. The, the arts are the secret sauce for what makes a good and a just society. A society. And when we understand that the cultivation of the arts is in fact the cultivation of our own lives as citizens of a democracy. That the cultivation of capacity to make art, capacity to receive art, is exactly what is going to make this democracy either thrive or not. Um, then you begin to recognize that it's not like the arts are over here and citizenship and politics are over there. These things feed one another in this wonderful, wonderful virtuous cycle, right? And uh, I think the, 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 tr the name of this track, um, I think it's worth just sitting with for a moment. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of brilliant, the idea that we are part of the citizen artist track. Uh, because to me, I think about that in both directions, right? Which is, again, reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Citizens, uh, certainly artists as citizens, and Damien, you embody that incredibly. You know, a, as a performer, as a creator, as somebody who is taking your art into civic life in a hundred different ways, right? But also the other direction, citizen as artist. That simply to show up and participate in the life of a community in how you make a neighborhood better, in how you engage in politics, whether it's at the level of East and West Wing or East and West uh, you know, Palo Alto or whatever it might be, that you are being an artist. You are applying habits of mind of empathy. You're applying habits of mind of creative problem solving. Um, and that to be a citizen is, in many ways, if we're being awake and aware about it, to be an artist. And so I think the reciprocity of those two roles there is something that is super important for us to, uh, to attend to as well. 
this goes back to the conversation we were having this morning, and I was thinking more about it. Because we were talking a little bit about music, and I immediately latched on. I, I love all kinds of music. My name is Melody. I love all kinds of music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not the by name accident. Does shape one. Yeah, yes, my, my mother and father had a goal. <laughs> um, and I immediately jumped to Marvin Gaye. But I started thinking about both ends of that uh, after our conversation and both this role as artist, as citizen, and citizen as artist. So you think about, I was thinking and it popped to mind, Billie Holiday, 1939, Strange Fruit. And the lyrics to that music were all about lynching in America and the prevalence of it and the pain in the community and drawing attention to it at the same time as there, was, there were efforts underway to start to put new laws and policies in place to, to change it. That, that music lives on and it's very powerful. It really elicits something um, visceral in people as they heard it. You can fast forward to the 70s and Marvin Gaye and inner city blues make you wanna holler. And he was talking about financial crisis. He was talking about the war. He was talking about what was happening in communities in America all over the place. And you think about artists at that time who were so much a part of the policy conversation in the same way that you are today. And then you fast forward a little bit further, late 70s, early 80s, and you think about rap. And rap, and I remember when I was, you know, we were talking this morning, 13, 14, it was just getting underway. And I remember my mother like, I hate that, what's going on? But Matt, rap at that time was pretty happy. My husband and I often talk about this. It was, it was fun. And you listened to those lyrics and they were kind of bouncing. It was fun to dance to. And you fast forward and you go later and deeper into the 80s and you see rap become or you hear it become nihilistic. And when there was such a sense of discouragement and there was such a sense of destruction about it, and that was reflecting something that was happening in the community. It was a mirror through which people could see what was happening and starting to happen in those communities. And it was happening on the ground. It's, it's the citizen as artist. And that back and forth, if we paid attention to it, would have given us a very early hint of the kinds of problems with poverty, with crack, the destruction of family units, a whole set of a basket of issues that we needed to pay attention to on a policy level. So that back and forth, that, ref that mirror, that artist as citizen, citizen as artist, I think plays out just if you look at those three points on this, on this time spectrum, and you can see it with dance, you can see it with painting, you can see it with all forms of the arts, with literature as well. You know, I, I could not agree more, and uh, one of the things, just before I came over here, um, I heard music, and so I was drawn to it and I went over to the music tent and uh, I think the Aspen Youth Orchestra was rehearsing with Brian Green their performance uh, I think later this evening of Icarus at the Edge of Time. Uh, and watching them uh, made me remember and realize something very powerful which is just about everything I know about how to be in a democracy, I learned from playing in an orchestra when I was a kid <laughs> and through, uh, through my college years. Uh, everything I learned uh, not only about um, you know, and, and a lot of people, this was, if those of you who were at the panel that uh, Damien led yesterday with uh, Yo-Yo Ma and a group of music directors from around the country, this was a central part of your conversation yesterday, which is getting past the old model of the orchestra where the conductor sits on Mount Olympus and everybody else is a minion, right? Uh, and I think if we are to understand an orchestra in democratic terms, we are all leading from whatever chair we sit in. Right? Our responsibility, we cannot absolve ourselves of responsibility to say, okay, the guy at the podium, he's got this. Right? I'm just going to chill out and let him tell me what to do. Right? That, that orchestras that are successful and effective uh, are, are ones where everybody are empowered, are, are empowered and people are, are tuning yeah. in and listening to each other mm -hmm. even as they create. Right? And I think to me, that is the essence of what it means to govern ourselves, is actually hear each other, not I'm going to sing over you and you're going to play louder than me, but right. know, how are we going to riff off each mm -hmm. other, right, in just the way that well, Melody's talking it's about? It's, it's jazz. It's jazz, but it's also, it's about developing what you refer to habits of mind, artistic habits of mind, which involve listening. Mm -hmm. As you said, listening to those lyrics in the mid to late 80s would have given us clues for policy. In the same way that, you know, when President Kennedy um, eulogized Robert Frost, mm -hmm. he talked about, you know, it's not always what we want to hear. The role of the artist is to get to say it 
And then we, it's our role to be receptive. But likewise, I often think that we just did a discussion about participation in the arts and innovation. And some of the programming that goes on in design work here on Sethi's program, Design for Change, is all about listening. Mm -hmm. And in her case, it's about listening to up to 25 million children who tell, tell us what the problem really is, mm -hmm. as opposed to us prescribing this is what the problem is. And I think in the same way, uh, the arts and artists and citizens in their communities have this resource that is often kept from them in some ways by financial uh, burdens, mm -hmm. perhaps. But also, it's about opening up the possibility and listening on the art side. I mean, what part of the, my goal in this was to, for you to tell me, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. What can the art side do to make these, these communities truly rich, right. as you said? And, and uh, a phrase that came up in one of our discussions was the urgent crowding out the important. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you think, in a, you and I spoke about this, that if in a community, you are literally trying to get to the next day because of financial issues or you know, community strife, whether it's you know, violence or all, the, all the, the, the scourges of society. How do the arts actually, how can they be, you know, play that meaningful role that I think we all sense, believe in, know? And I think perhaps the key is a word you used a minute ago, which is participation. Whether it's participating in uh, an orchestra and understanding, you're learning your civics lessons by doing not by being told. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, in some of the, the things that you've done policy-wise, Melody, whether, you know, you look at our world, the arts world, and I know that you've had a background in theater yourself. Disgust. <laughs> my, as, my husband, look, he's back there going, oh God, please don't help her live this myth. <laughs> but what is it that, you know, you think is most useful in this participatory sure. way? Or, or some examples of ways that uh, you'd like to see things develop to create this, these communities that we talked about. Sure. Well, we've seen it. I mean, the work that we did together, a lot of it focused on education. And we focused on a program called Turnaround um, Arts. As we were confronting the dropout problem in our schools, as we were looking at the poorest performing schools in the country, the importance of the arts in those schools. So again, not just arts on the margin, but arts integration, which is something very, very different. Um, and the importance of one, well, I'll back up one second. We, we sense it and feel it, but there's data to support it. So one of the important things I think that we have to do is put the data out front, put the science out front. So for low-income kids in these lowest performing schools, we know that those that are involved in the arts are four times as likely to perform more highly academically, to have higher attendance levels. Um, we also know in studies that, and there are two of them that are very, very important, when you look forward to those same kids in their 20s, that they have more, they're more likely to have completed college. They are more likely to, have, to hold down a job and to maintain a career. They're more likely to volunteer in their communities, that they're more likely to, to vote and to be active civically. Mm -hmm. So we, the data is there to support the fact that arts in, the, in low income communities is something that's very important. And one of the things that our work focused on is the fact that arts can make things sticky, can make education sticky. So for that child mm -hmm. that, you know, I struggle at school, it's not necessarily something that's talked about in, at, at home, but I go to school and I love being in the band, or I love to be in, I'm in the drama club. That's the thing that continues to draw kids to school and keep them there, and also make the rest of their experience more enjoyable, and for the rest of it to stick. And then you get the kind of benefits that I was just talking about. So that's one example. I think, of, you know, when, when that word sticky, you know, has a lot of new meanings in this society, you know, we think about web pages and stickiness, how long do people stay, and we think about learning, will, it, will you remember it? Um, Yo-Yo talks a lot about, you know, without the, a passion uh, that the arts can bring, it's not as memorable, and it creates memorability to, to, to weave the arts into anything you're talking about, you know, and we know it in, in, the, in the most simplistic ways, like the ABC song, to, I mean, literally, it is a song, as we know. Uh, but, but it's also about, you know, to my mind, some things that, you know, Paul Tuff has written about stick with itness, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm -hmm. You learn to stick with something. Uh, and we've certainly explored that a little bit on our side, so in the arts education field, about learning how to perform it has many connotations. There's performance in terms of, wow, that is a very gifted performer. There's also the ability actually to stand up and say something. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about voice. 
Maybe, Eric, you want to talk about the idea of a voice, having a voice in your own life, a voice in society, and the difference in my mind that the arts can bring to that conversation is, is across the community, it's education, but it's also uh, as adults, the ability to express yourself. I think this is so crucial, Damien, and, and to, uh, to return us to the kind of the undercurrent of this conversation, which was, you know, this, I think the name of this was the true arts in the truly rich society, right? And you, you began with this framing that we are living through this moment in America, George Packer is calling it the unwinding, uh, where we are in this most severe inequality since uh, the era of the Great Depression. Uh, and so the question of arts as a vehicle for voice, for uh, developing voice, for exercising voice, um, the more unequal society becomes, the more unequal access to art becomes, the more unequal this basic core civic capacity to cultivate voice becomes, right? So again, th this is, when you think about it, whether it's literally theater when you are standing on stage and delivering and performing, uh, or any other form uh, of art making, the ability to first, actually I think the making of voice uh, begins, as you said, uh, with listening and with empathy. The ability, number one, to empathize with another, and then it's number two, to convert that empathy and what it is that you receive before you transmit, uh, and to convert that then into something that is uniquely your own voice, um, we're not born knowing how to do that, right? And those of us who uh, are able to be at a place like this, we've had a lifetime of experiences, some formal, most informal, where we have learned these skills and these aptitudes. And I think for us, one of the concerns that we have to have about arts um, is that, uh, again, the best way to close the opportunity gap in this country, the best way to help create brighter prospects for the opportunity youth that Melody and her project work on here at Aspen uh, is to ensure that, to the widest extent possible, young people who do not have material privilege and material opportunity get the opportunity through art to learn to, to express and articulate their voice. Uh, and I think that is, um, voice and empathy um, are, you know, I'm not sure, you can reduce and boil down democracy <laughs> to voice and empathy. Uh, you, you take those things out and you are left with a bunch of functional procedural things, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and when only a subset of our society is really getting good at practicing voice and empathy and really getting exposure, then you know, the question that is framing part of this Ideas Festival, are we more pluribus than unum? Are we more pluribus than unum, right? And art is the only thing that's going to help stitch together that pluribus uh, in durable, deep, kind of heart-level ways. But, and even before this uh, panel began, some of us were sitting and talking about you know, the economy, what's needed, you know, s slow recover recovery, but slow recovery. And some of those skills that we talk to employers about, the things that they need that they aren't seeing as our kids are coming out of high school, as they are going through college, coming out of college, you know, we talk about voice, but we also talk about the analytic skills, communication skills, discipline, the ability to work collaboratively and to work in groups. So much of that is learned mm -hmm. through the arts. You were talking about orchestra and band. I had the exact same experience. You know, we were talking about you know, my erstwhile taking theater uh, my, my theater <laughs> classes. You know, as I was working on the Hill, as I was you know, an executive vice president for policy at the Center for American Progress, and whereas I don't have talent there, the, what I learned and the joy that I had in doing that used a part of my brain that then when I would go back to my desk in Senator Kennedy's office, when I go back to my desk at CAP, literally I, could, I would see problems differently. I could often find and access um, answers and solutions to problems in a different way that I absolutely connect to that, those other experiences that I was having. This That's is so, uh, we have to stay with this point for a minute because I think this is, this is so important. What you're talking about is uh, transfer of an analogy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you, you experienced thing here in, in, in A, which was acting classes, right? And you were able by analogy to transfer it to how you were going to deal with situations on the Hill, mm -hmm. at CAP, at the White House, and so forth. And this ability to transfer from one realm to another is... It's a primary artistic skill. Is a primary artistic yeah. skill, and yeah. it is a primary democratic skill. But right? and from our side, the arts world in the 21st century, here, now, is adjusting to the reality that it's not enough simply to be a great artist either. Mm -hmm. In this world, we actually do need to participate, and this, that's what citizen artistry is all about from that side. It's about how one actually is a full participant. 
as an artist or as a citizen. And what I want to, when I add to, to what Eric, what you were saying is that when I, when I listen to you, all I can think is it's, it's about long term. Who do we want to be when we grow up? Yeah. What are we trying to create here? And again, it's about the urgent crowding out the important in some ways because there are economic crisis issues. There are all kinds of things that will, you know, we deal with on a minute, hour, daily, weekly basis that are imminent threats, if you will, to well-being. But overall, what is it we're trying to create? It's Howard Gardner. It's truth, beauty, and goodness. What is the long-term thing? And it takes work. And that's the other point I wanted to make, that all of this sounds nice in some ways, but it's actually about work. I mean, you said you weren't so great at theater. Well, maybe we'll have an opportunity to work on this <laughs> and see. Not. But I bet you work pretty hard. Mm -hmm. In the end, you have to. There's, it's not nice. When we talk about an artistic classroom experience, I don't think of it as it's going to be really nice for the kids. I think of it as how are they going to be engaged? How is it going to happen that when I walk into a classroom where, and we all know what this means when you see a child's eyes that are not available for learning, they simply have not had, that the receptors aren't there, that how do we activate somebody? It's work, actually. It's, anybody saw Pierre Dulaine's movie last night? He's working to create peace, essentially, between children through the arts. And it's hard for them, and it's, it's you know, they, we all like to think, Oh, it's so inspiring, but you know there are hard truths in Billie Holiday's music, mm -hmm. and this is that's work as well. How we grapple with it. So, so maybe we should look a little bit at the hard parts of this, which are you know when we think about activating you know our an impoverished community through the arts. What's in the way? Mm -hmm. What's in the way of it? Is it is it just finance, or is it is there more to it? Is it focus finance? What do you think, Melody? If I came to you and I said I want to do all these things, right? Well, I I think. Finance is definitely a significant issue because people you are using the phrase, you know, the um, urgent getting in, in the way. Um, and people don't correlate and don't see how those things are woven together. So I think that's one issue. I think also we tend to operate in silos. That's what I think. And, yeah. you know, so we've got arts over here and we've got economic <laughs> development here and we have job creation over here and we rarely think about how those things are integrated. You know, one of, I know Rocco Landisman was here last year, at the former head of the NEA, National Endowment of the Arts, and he created a program, and we worked together on this, called Our Town. And I think it was brilliant for several reasons. One, that Rocco walked into that position, and everyone said to him, and we've talked about this, you're going to be defunded, or they're going to cut your funding, no one's going to pay attention, no one cares, et cetera. And what he did with this amazing background that he has in the arts was recognize that he had to connect that work to the other things that people immediately recognize as the urgent. So job loss, economic revitalization, economic development. Can, and, I, can I jump in for one mm -hmm, sec? Please. In that definition of the urgent, Rocco was actually in some ways flouting the arts community. The arts community's urgent was, help us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're here. You're the National Endowment for the Arts. Right. Arts, right. come on. Right. And Rocco went, I'm thinking a large scale picture is arts and society. Right. Arts and the transportation department. Right. Arts and blank. And that is going to help in the bigger sense. So he, he, he I'm sure he mm -hmm. did the urgent. The urgent went on. but. He went to you and said, I need to do the large picture. Right, and how to connect. And he went to every cabinet secretary. He went to Arnie Duncan at education. He went to Kathleen at HHS. He went to Ray LaHood at transportation, on and on and on. And they all got it and loved it and saw the point of collaboration. And he created this program, Our Town, which focuses on economic revitalization and the importance that the arts plays. So he lifted up the data points that say when arts come into a community, other things tend to follow and t tend to surround that and create a stronger and more vibrant community and a stronger and vibrant, eco more vibrant economic base. So how do we work together? And he went to the philanthropic community, he went to all of those departments and agencies, and as a result, created a larger program that has, is working in every state and the District of Columbia and focusing on those points of intersection. So it is bringing the arts community in. I mean, they're interesting places. They're, you know, urban farms working with, um, um, working with artists that are creating sculpture that actually are helping to create renewable energy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's right. the urgent, you know, yeah. energy, food, 
the arts coming together. Also, but um, it's work too. It, right, and, and it's precisely. Solution, and it's answering a need, and it's a solution. Precisely, yeah. festivals. Yeah. Thinking about you know revenue that comes in off of tourism. Um, taking these programs into schools. It's over and over looking at these elements of people's lives and recognizing that the arts has, have to be, should be, must be integrated and we can get something bigger and smarter when we do that. You know, I think one of the things that I would uh, say on this question of, well, actually our town is a great metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 sometimes the conversation about arts and democracy can seem too big at the national level, uh, but if you think about this just in terms of your town, right? I'm from Seattle, uh, and uh, I love my town. And one of the reasons why I think my town is going to keep on winning in America is because we have a strong commitment to not just supporting the arts, but integrating the arts into every aspect of private and public life, integrating it into global health, integrating it into new approaches to philanthropy, integrating it into what Amazon and Starbucks and Boeing are all doing as they try to innovate and crack open their sense of imagination and possibility, right? So uh, if you want your town to win, wherever it is, it can be Tulsa, it can be Tampa, it can be Cleveland, whatever. If you want your town to win, then thinking about how you make arts the, uh, a vital part of that ecosystem. Uh, I'm fond of a metaphor, as, as Damien knows, um, uh, the gardens of democracy. Right? We all tend these gardens, but the, the arts are just a, a, a crucial part uh, of that garden. And one of the things that you know, we haven't talked about so much here. You, I, I like your emphasis on this is hard, mm -hmm. this is hard work. There's another piece of it too, which is worth talking about, which voice gets to a little bit, but this is about power as well. Mm. Art is about power. And, uh, the, you know, almost anywhere in the world where you have truly, you know, incredible totalitarian concentrations of power, you think about the uprisings of the Arab Spring. You think about Tiananmen Square many years ago. You think about, in, in all of these moments, you think about Occupy Wall Street. In all of these moments, there has been a creative, artistic expression as part of the political expression, right? At any point, and it's no, it's no accident that any time you've had a rise of a totalitarian state or ruler in any part of the world, one of the first things they want to get control of is the capacity to make art and make voice, right? Uh, and so we don't live in a totalitarian society, but we do live in one where mobility is slowing and opportunity is clumping. Mm -hmm. And the more it clumps, the more power clumps, the more that the opportunity to uh, decide. I mean, it's great to have in your town a program that's going to do uh, a garden and renewable energy and, and so on, but something preceded that. And what preceded that was somebody decided that that should be a project, right? <laughs> Uh, and this question of who decides, who gets to decide in the first place, who gets to be in the room to program uh, what we do in, in local self-government or at the Aspen Ideas Festival is a question uh, that art has everything to do with. The more we infuse young people with the capacities of art, the more power they have to shape what it is that we're all even going to talk about. And I would say shape it in a, a both a short and long-term sense. I mean, I think that, that can't lose sight of that idea that the arts breed perspective. There's the endless perspective. We did a, a program, uh, the arts program, with the public theater a week ago in New York on Shakespeare and money. There were Shakespeare speeches referencing money and morals, and Michael Sandel did a town hall discussion about it. And out of that, of course, Michael's emphasis is very much that we've become, uh, from a market economy, we've, it's, that has spread to be a market society which takes over everything, all the choices, as you say, the decisions, the decider, how that happens is all based in market society. This thinking. is the thing, actually, that binds thinking about art with thinking about citizenship, this fact of market imperialism, right? That, everything, that we think of ourselves first now as, cons as consumers rather than as citizens. Uh, and the more you have that, the more that market thinking, cost-benefit analysis, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. kind of infects the way you think about everything else, whether it's art or democracy, uh, the more you forget that, no, 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 civic life and artistic life are meant to stand on their own terms, terms that are equal with... Not market terms. Not market terms, yeah. right? I mean, I, I would, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's a thought experiment worth doing to think about what would cultural imperialism look like if, if you were to measure the worth of the Fortune 100 by their cultural and artistic contribution, right? If you were to measure the programs of government policies by how much they open up people's capacities for imagination and creativity, we will never be there. But it's a thought experiment to make you realize all the implicit, un 
uh, unwitting ways in which this market way of thinking and valuing things um, mm -hmm. infects uh, all conversations. And I think citizen artistry is about saying, here is a domain that is meant to be exempt from that, and here is a domain that, uh, because it's exempt from that, uh, allows us actually to be a republic and not just a giant um, uh, agglomeration of consumers. I think that, that when you talk about who makes those decisions and how those programs get started, this is where responsibility can be shared. It's not just government, obviously. It's a partnership with citizenry, with society, with arts groups. So when I think about that, I think about, OK, I produce and direct a number of arts ventures. And my version of what an arts organization does in this day and age includes that piece. And that is an increasing reality that is about survival, it's about power and reciprocal for arts organizations. But that has to be recognized as a given, in a sense, that it's the way Bob Steele said to me one day, it's like the way you're talking is the way you talk about technology. It used to be on the side, something we did, and now if you're not using technology, you're just a complete loser. You're not doing whatever it is you're doing. You're, not, you're just not doing it. And he said, that's what the arts are in, in the Bloomberg administration. He says, no matter what I'm doing in economic development, I have Patty Harris telling me, where are the arts? because you're not doing it fully. You're not engaging. And the other word uh, you know, I wanted to bring up, um, my wife Heather just said to me, you should talk about social contagion. Now, I'm sure when you talk about domestic policy, you talk about urbanization, and the sheer numbers of people in, in cities. And I listened to Jeffrey West talking last year about the exponential theory of when you put more people together, what happens? It's not just linear. You know, If you have 100,000 people and there's a 7% rate of some something, uh, if you have 200,000 people, it's still 7%. No, 200,000 people, it goes up because of social contagion. And the arts are, are primary vehicles for social contagion. When we look at cities growing and urbanization, not just in America, but around the world, I think that must, there, there's something here that we have to think about, you know, the galvanizing effect of the arts to, to create the kind of society we want. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. I mean, we've been talking about it through, throughout the way that you know, literature and dance and music have propelled movements, um, mm -hmm. that they have provided a narrative and a common voice um, mm -hmm. that people uh, can relate to. And, and also interesting, I think now, you know, there used to be people who talk about black radio and they would talk, you know, there was this segmentation of music. And now when you listen and you look and see who's listening to what, you recognize that it crisscrosses, you know, economic lines, it crisscrosses uh, race and, eth and ethnic lines. I mean, so it really gives voice to something larger than who we are as individuals and can propel ideas and movements in a way that very, uh, very few things can. I think that's exactly right. But I think it also goes from a community voice to a, you could say, it just grows out to a national voice of who we are and it's telling globally. our story. And globally. And you know, the other thing here, of course, is legacy. This is what, I mean, we're still doing Shakespeare speeches. 400 years later, and that's the, 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 that tells us what life was like then. And these are you know, the songs, and the theater, and the dance, and the, and the literature that we'll, we are remembered for. This really is it. It's not going to be about something else. It's going to be about who we are as a people. What type of a people were we? What type of people were they? Well, they were very worried about consumerism, about what they were going to have. Now, and I, I think we all live in the same world, so I'm not, I'm not looking for utopia here, but I think perspective is, contextual perspective is what the arts give. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, you, you, that came out in the other panel that you moderated yesterday, Damien, was, uh, and I can't remember who it was, I think it might have been the music director here at Aspen, um, uh, who, who was talking about one of the beautiful, powerful things about music is that it is a regular opportunity to commune with the dead, right? A regular opportunity to take inert legacy texts that were created by people long before us and revivify them, right? And just reinfuse them with life and meaning in the context of our own times and our own life right now. And, you know, your text can be, you know, Mahler 4, uh, or your text can be the Gettysburg Address, right? Uh, but these are both great texts uh, that if they just sit there, they're just sitting there. And part of what we have to do is cultivate in each generation both, uh, again, the skills and the desire uh, to want to breathe new life into those kinds of, uh, those kinds of texts. And th that idea of legacy is something that, um, um, it's, what, it's what it's all about. 
Well, I mean, Melody, you referenced the, the needs of, uh, for, for, for uh, jobs today, mm -hmm. you know, and what those skill sets are. And when, when I listened to that, what Eric just said, I mean, those are artistic habits of mine are readdressing, mm -hmm. essentially. When you think about design, it's readdressing. Is it this? Okay, we're going to redesign. And it's all about betterment. And those are skills that get developed or not, or it's simply you're complacent and you live with what you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the society I think that we all want to live in and we all want to project forward is all about betterment in that sense. And what better tool than these artistic habits of mind? Right. And again, not about making like the, the greatest artist. That's a byproduct of introducing, you know, everybody having that artistic access. When you think about small children, they talk about um, phonological skills, mm -hmm. you know, introduction to the arts early, but those skills are the same ones that often lead to early reading skills. Mm -hmm. And so it is, the arts can play such an important part in, in human development, childhood development, and ultimately the development of those skills that we've talked about that are so critical to be able to exist and to um, have a robust and vibrant life as a citizen um, in this country. Participating. A participatory society. It's yeah. also participating from an angle that you might not otherwise come at things, right? So we, every year we do this gathering um, uh, around citizenship uh, called Citizen University, and we bring all these folks who are practitioners, leaders, thinkers, activists to come and talk uh, in kind of Aspen style about different dimensions of what it means to be an effective, engaged, strong citizen. But oftentimes the most sticky part of that gathering is when we bring in, um, so last year, for instance, we brought in uh, Elevator Repair Service, this experimental theater company uh, in New York that's famous for having taken the full text of The Great Gatsby uh, and uh, reenacted it, kind of word for word in this, uh, it sounds like it would be a death march, but it's actually incredibly <laughs> arresting uh, because of the creative, unusual way in which they've taken this text uh, and sort of perform and embody it. And so they took that methodology and they applied it to a Supreme Court case, to an oral argument in a famous Supreme Court case uh, about obscenity and uh, you know, strip clubs and, and, and all this stuff. Uh, and they had a group of actors that are playing the justices of the Supreme Court um, and just literally performing the transcript of the oral argument and bringing it back to life. And now, you know, if you were just to turn on C-SPAN and watch something, you know, a, a state Supreme Court oral argument, you would, within you know, half a second, uh, turn the channel. But there was something strangely compelling and arresting about seeing this performed in this unusual sideways way, right? And I think the, the, the uh, again, the, I, I want to keep returning to this theme of the concentration of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Only a few people in America get to have the opportunity to see things that sideways, that creative, that mind opening, that heart opening, right? And our job is to democratize that at Correct. every turn. Mm -hmm. That's right. Our job is to democratize the opportunity to see things coming uh, fr from these unusual angles of entry uh, so that we equip the full breadth of our next generation um, with the ability to, to create their own great mm -hmm. works. Innovation. Yeah. I think on that note, our job is to let, uh, let all voices be heard in all <laughs> places in society, including in this room. So we're going to go to some question and answers in a moment. So I think there's some microphones in the room. Uh, I want to just say one last thing before that, which is that you know, the, the charge of this is to make all these nice ideas happen, which is, is the hard thing. But, and that, from my point of view, that's what Citizen Artists and Citizen Artists Track is all about, is that every single person, whether it's Eric, Melody, or myself, or all of you in this room, have a place in this. It's not, you all have a place in making a better society, and this, these, are, these are tools we're discussing, essentially. If you're on the board of an arts organization saying, I love what you're doing, but can, how does that relate to the, the curriculums in that neighborhood? I love this, but how can I do that? If you're on the Chamber of Commerce and you think, I, I, we have a great thing here, wow, I bet the arts could actually make this socially contagious, that people want to be a part of this thing, that they know about it, they come here and do it. That's a large part of our conversations about how we relate, but on everybody's plate is the task of saying, how can we make this betterment happen? And we all do have a role in it, I think. So with that said, please. Well, Start right here. Uh, Damien, I just want to follow up on what you just said because I'm going to uh, feed back these wonderful, and first off, let me say, my name is Robert Lerma. I'm a patron of the arts. I serve on the museum board. I believe in everything you're saying, but let me just say to you, art is, 
helps human development, education, opens up creativity, improves school performance and attendance. Art's about power and connecting civic life to artistic life. The partnership should be a broader group beyond government and is a vehicle for voice. But the artistic voice we know tends to be a singular voice. And what I'd like to hear you approach is how does that singular aspect of creativity get linked to a pluralistic society in a way that is, in fact, effective? That's the question you just asked. Because nobody here has made that clear to me. I have drunk the Kool-Aid. I don't understand how the transmission gets the engine working from this gas tank of creativity. Okay, so I think we all should take a, 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 a swipe at that, take a whack at it, Senator Kenny once said, take a whack at that one. Uh, I, I, first of all, I reject the premise that it's a singular, the, the singular versus plural, because I think of the arts as actually having many voices. I mean, there's a singular voice in some ways of a sole artist writing his novel, perhaps. But if that is related to larger things already, it's, it's more than that. The way Balanchine, uh, founder of New York City Ballet, choreographer, was challenged about story ballads. He said, you got a man and a woman on the stage, how much story do you need? It was already there. It's <laughs> built in to the, to the work. Now, there are ways to capitalize on it and to relate things out. And I think that's what you're getting at. We all believe it can happen, but how does this happen in larger sense? I think it's by giving people a voice in it. In some ways, it's about making the, the touchstone in the community. Let's say we talked about uh, the Dream Project yesterday with the Memphis Symphony is doing about uh, relating the I Have a Dream speech to music. Out of that comes curriculum. Out of that comes commissions. Out of that comes many voices in one artistic goal, perhaps, but there's always more to add on to it. It is not simply a singular thing. Uh, I would also say that if from a creative point of view in the education field, the, a large part of what what I've been working on and so many others before me and before, you know, this is time immemorial in a sense, but I'll say right now, particularly, for instance, tomorrow we have a little demonstration of this in the Benedict Music Tent at 240. We've developed things where the kids themselves get to create their own words and, and set to music and perform and have that moment which transforms them from passive learners to active learners. And that's a primary artistic thing which it's part of the artistic experience, whether any type of artist deals with this. If you put us in a situation uh, where there's, a, there's a, a show to go on, we ask when does it start, and we figure out what to do with it, this is another artistic task, uh, and it is one that is plural. So I am a huge proponent of cross-sector collaboration. And in fact, little trailer, we'll be making an announcement about that at five o'clock today in the pavilion, some work that we're doing with regard to Opportunity Youth. But I say that not, not just in a um, kumbaya, let's link arms, I like you, let's, I, you like me, let's collaborate. I mean, there's a very specific way to go about collaboration in communities, a phrase that's being used quite often now called collective impact. One of, uh, an aspect of collective impact is that there has to be a big goal that different sectors and programs in those sectors all ascribe to and agree to. And often that can play out in communities through economic development plans as a single example. That requires the business sector, the education sector, local government, the arts and culture sector, others working together to think how are we going to revitalize and increase opportunity in, these, in this sector. I think our town, which is an example I use, speaks to some of that work, but I think specifically to the question that you ask, the arts and culture community has a very specific role to play and economic development I'm using because it's something that I think it's front of mind for most of us in the country right now in thinking about how we pursue those economic goals for communities. I think it's critical for nonprofit arts organizations. I think you know when you look at the symphony, when you think about um, you think about uh, the museums, you think about other arts um, organizations and entities, that they be a part of that kind of cross-sector collaboration for effective collective impact. And I think that's a very specific way that a, the sector of arts and culture can be involved more broadly with other sectors as they're focused on a specific goal. You know, you move to education, which is something that we briefly touched on. You can easily um, see the President's Committee on Arts and Humanities report around um, turnaround arts and arts integration that speaks to some very specific ways that arts 
need, that we need to think about training, development, data, working with our school systems, very specific ways that, again, art artists, teaching artists, and those who support the arts in their communities can be um, actively involved in how we think about those low-performing schools, the dropout crisis, and how to turn those schools around. So, you know, you can debate, you know, the singularity or the plurality of it. I, I, but I, the collaborativeness no, cuts into it no right, matter what. Exactly. If you say, yes, even if you say, okay, that is a singular thing, oh my goodness, make it the airport and the spokes out of collaboration, and you've, you've made the plural impact that we're looking at, the collective impact. You know, I think one of the things that I agree with, um, with both of you, and I, you know, the, the premise, if I, if I heard the premise right about singularity, I think there's something worth kind of honing in on here for, for a minute. It, it's very associated with the reactions that many people have in general to creativity and imagination, which is that kind of the, the conventional popular wisdom is that this is a solo genius kind of thing, and that some of us are touched with the ma magic fairy dust, and most of us are not, right? And so therefore, I'm not one of those creative types. I'm not one of those imaginative types. That's this guy over here. That's Melody or Damien over there, right? Um, and I think the notion that art making uh, is itself a singular act of genius is a close cousin to that same preconception and, e and for the same reason, uh, um, a little bit dangerous for us in thinking about what we try to do in community together, right? Any innovation, I don't care whether you're talking about um, even the writing of a novel, I am an author, you know, the writing of a book, a nonfiction book, uh, let alone something that is truly and very obviously a collaborative production, a ballet, a, a, a musical, whatever. You know, in all of these realms, we have to remember two things. Number one, that everybody involved uh, is a creative contributor. Every single one of us has a capacity for imagination and creativity that often is lying dormant, right? And, uh, and, and part of our job as citizen artists and as artists uh, you know, who are civically engaged uh, is to think about how to uh, make active that latent capacity. Uh, but the second thing I would say is this. You know, this goes right back to where, Damien, you were beginning this conversation. One of the things that is most, if market imperialism is a big dangerous thing in the United States, so is an overblown myth of rugged individualism, right? where lone man out in the range is going to get it done, right? And, sure. you know, here we are in the West, and I assure you, not a single park, not a single ranch in Colorado was carved out, fenced in, managed and maintained by a lone, rugged individual cowboy riding in on his horse. No barn in the state of Colorado was ever raised by a lone cowboy doing it on his own. There's a larger mythology here of what we are as Americans that we have to challenge under the arts by being something that is about story and is inherently collaborative helps us challenge, right? And it's to, to recognize that we do these things together and we're all better off when we're all better off, right? That storyline is something that the arts embody, uh, whether you're a patron, whether you are a maker of art, or whether you are uh, uh, enjoying the art. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's something we really got to hold on to. And I would just go further and weave these three things together in answer to the question is that, and the obligation and the, the, the premise of this panel is about creating those opportunities where they are challenged in this society, in places burdened by poverty, where it doesn't happen on its own. I do believe that art happens on its own. It bubbles up. I'm not the kind of person who thinks you need a beautiful studio to create a ballet. You don't. If you want to choreograph a dance and you have it in you, you're going to do it. It's going to happen somewhere, somehow. But if you're in a situation, if you're in a community that doesn't have the kind of teachers in schools that can illuminate an artistic experience for a child, and that just doesn't happen for you, or if you're in the type of community that there is no collective sense that we can all participate and be a part of the orchestra in some way, that we have a voice, and that becomes non-participatory, that is what we're talking about. But how do we actually see these things? And when Melody references those President's Committee recommendations on education, those are all in there in some ways. Uh, but we have to leave them out. Uh, one more question, and then we should probably go on. Lady, right down here. Uh, microphone's coming to you. So I agree with everything that you've said. And we understand that arts is a form of communication. And uh, different uh, political leaders, like Senator Fulbright, has shown us that this is a very important aspect of peacemaking. 
and that one culture understands another through the arts. And this allows a world to be at peace because people understand people to people and it's not a government to government relationship. How come the United States doesn't have a Department of Arts and Culture as other countries do throughout the world? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I think where we see it is at the NEA, the NEH. Um, we see it as it integrates itself between the East and the West Wings of the White House, and then we see it as we are working to integrate it into departments and agencies. But I would also say that if you look historically, you, know, you think back over the last 20 or so years, and you think about um, some of the battles that we've had on the policy level, and that we continue to have around arts and culture, that the idea of introducing a Department of Arts and Culture and what that would mean, you know, everybody has their different view of what, of what that means to, and I'm just speaking very pragmatically, to stand it up, to fund it, and to allow it to move forward, I, I think would be a tremendous struggle, and that's probably an, an understatement if you just look at the battles with NEA and NEH over, over the years. Um, but those are places now that we use to try and to support financially um, different, different kinds of arts, um, arts in the community, to lift up the arts in the, in the country, and that's the role across administrations, Republican and Democrat, that uh, the White House has often played to list, lift up the best forms of, of art and culture in America. Um, but I, I, it's hard for me to imagine what it would look like in Congress right now to support um, that, kind, that kind of effort. Um, I think it would be kind of muzzled um, before <laughs> it ever got out. I mean, I think one can look at it also from the point of view of, you know, when we talk about how the arts are, can be a positive benefit across a range of issues, we have, you know, from the State Department angle to Department of Education, the arts, I mean, I'm a believer in the arts actually being everywhere, that it's all of the benefit. And there are ways to coordinate it better, and there are ways to make it more available. And I think that's what we're trying to look at here in some ways, about how to, how to, to make those coordinated elements available and understandable. And, and everybody knows that these things are available uh, through citizen artists, through artists as citizens. Okay, one last question. Can I just speak to that yeah, question please, yeah. real quickly? You know, I, I, the one thing that slightly concerns me about our conversation is that we're all in agreement. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think it's actually important for us to think about one of the purposes of art is to teach us how to disagree well, right? Uh, and, ha and how to recognize that there are irreconcilable disagreements in life, whether democratic life or personal life. And I actually think this idea of you know, what would it look like to create a United States Department of Art and Culture, something like that, uh, is worth putting on the table if for no other reason than to get us to argue about it. And to, and to have that be the object that forces us to argue about federal control versus local you know, self-governance. To have that be the object that makes us argue about centralized dictation of what constitutes art versus bottom-up filtering up, right? Like, let's have that argument, right? I think, and, and we, if we were to spend the next hour here just arguing about that, I bet we wouldn't have as much consensus. There'd be a lot of like, ah, I don't want to do that, or oh, we got to totally do that, right? And that's the stuff that art can help us get to, is recognizing that um, here's a thing sitting here, and you're going to see it totally different from me, right? And we're going to talk about that, uh, and, uh, and we're going to argue about that. Uh, and I think the more we can pass that that pass that skill and mindset on to other people, uh, the more we're going to be doing our job as, as citizen artists. I like that. That's a good place to stop. So, thank you so much. Thank you, Mallory. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.